awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, Cisco rules. I don't care what y'all say. Y'all can fight me. All right, so my name is Ceci, and I'm here to talk to you about the psychology of fake news and what we can do about it as technologists. Um, before I get started, I did want to just give a shout out to Keep Ruby Weird. Uh, before I decided to become a programmer, I was kind of soul searching, trying to figure out what program I should learn and what community I joined was really important to me. So I decided to buy a ticket to the inaugural Keep Ruby Weird back in 2014, not knowing anything about Ruby. And I sat right there in the front row, and I saw this guy talk <laughs> about his cats. And I knew that this was the community for me. And um, I've uh, been into Ruby ever since. So still a newbie, but I'm very grateful for uh, to this community. And I'm just, it's for me, just amazing to be here talking to you right now. So thank you, Keep Ruby Weird. <laughs> so before we start talking about fake news right now, uh, I wanna talk about the future of fake news. And you can all, if you want to learn more about some of the stuff that uh, we're gonna talk about today, you can go to futureoffakenews.com. This is an episode put on by Radiolab where they go into uh, fake news um, a lot more in depth, and I'm just going to show you a quick clip. This film has been modified from its original version. It has been formatted to fit this screen, and it never happened. On the back end now of my presidency, now that it's almost completed, although there are all kinds of issues that I care about, the single most important thing I can do is play golf, because our parties have moved further and further apart, and it's harder and harder to find common ground. So, you know, when I said in 2004 that there were no red states or blue states, there are the United States of America, I was wrong. On the back end now of my presidency, now that it's almost completed, although there are all kinds of issues that I care about, the single most important thing I can do is playing golf because our parties have moved further and further apart and it's harder and harder to find common ground. So, you know, when I said in 2004 that there were no red states or blue states there in the United States of America, I was wrong. So there you go. Uh, that is the future of fake news. And if we take a look at that, uh, obviously the sort of uh, face manipulation is not quite there yet. Uh, I think it's pretty apparent that it's not real. Uh, but what I think is really interesting was uh, the technology behind the audio. Uh, so essentially, this comes from um, a piece of software called Project Voco uh, that hasn't been released as far as I know, but it is upcoming uh, with uh, Adobe Audition. Uh, and essentially what this does is that it takes this existing audio and because um, any person that's speaking for, say, a few seconds, maybe a couple minutes, they'll run through every sound necessary to produce the English language in just you know a few seconds, maybe a couple minutes. So if you have enough of an audio bite from someone, you can sort of run that through Project Voco and literally just type words and you'll get an audio clip in that person's voice of something that they didn't say. And I think that's really interesting because then you don't necessarily have to have video of someone actually moving their mouth. You can try to manipulate an existing video, uh, not show someone's mouth moving, but have that audio clip and produce something that's you know, pretty close to something that someone could say. Um, so that's not out there in the public yet, it's still upcoming. Uh, and again, if you wanna learn more about this technology, go to futureoffakenews.com. So I think that's interesting. Let's talk about the present though. Let's talk about how we got to this world we live in right now uh, with fake news sort of coming into our sphere. Um, a lot of people tend to blame uh, the social media bubble that platforms like Facebook have created. So let's kind of talk and go through that bubble. 
So first of all, we have things like selective feeds. So essentially this means that a platform like Facebook, and I think we all know this, they track the things that you click on, the things that you like, the things that you comment, and they try to show you content that fits that bill. And obviously from a product perspective, this makes sense because they want you to continue to engage with that platform, right? But what ends up, what ends up happening is that people are only receiving one type of information. Now, if you do happen to see a piece of information that you disagree with that you don't really want to see anymore, it's very easy to block. So you can go ahead and do that. But then also, we have things like link previews within things like Facebook where you can see a headline, you can see a blurb, and you can also see like a photo, and you can kind of get the gist of whatever that article is trying to say. So what ends up happening is that people no longer click on articles. Especially if you're consuming all of your information in a feed, you're probably just skimming through. You might like something, uh, but if you're actually going to click through, it really needs to grab your attention. So what ends up happening is that this gives way to clickbait. So it's a real problem when you have to write headlines in a way that really gets people's attention. So I'm going to share with you 10 ways that you can write effective headlines, and number nine is going to shock you. So what ends up happening now as a result of these things such as clickbait is that we get really targeted content and news outlets are beginning to really try to write their content in a way that they know their audience is going to react to, whether it's positively or negatively. Because if you react to it at that time, that's what's going to get you to click. So this is why coverage now is no longer really objective. It's really more, OK, what is what our audience will want to hear about this particular thing that's going to get them to actually interact with this story? So for example, this is the same event covered by two established media outlets, two completely different perspectives. So. Who do you believe? You're probably going to believe whichever outlet conforms already to your world view. And I think that this makes it really hard to really parse what's happening around us. Now again, these, these are both two established news sources. Fake news outlets also use this approach. So here uh, you have two news outlets. Uh, one is Liberal Society and the other one is Conservative 101. Guess what? They're both owned by the same person. Now, notice that I said person and not people or company because it's so easy now um, for someone to just get a couple of WordPress instances up on AWS uh, and then just spin up two sites. You throw, throw on a theme on there get some logo, and you just write the same story but with two different slants. And now if you notice something about both of these headlines, how they end, are you glad? And the other one is prepare to be infuriated. So, and again, this was not actual news. This was a rumor, rumor, rumor that was going around. It wasn't even anything substantiated. But you have to cover even the smallest whisper and then try to give it some sort of slant and you throw it on, on some website and then people will click on it. Um, so just so you get an idea, NPR did a, sto a story on uh, people that write fake news and maintain fake news websites. Uh, and the figure that's going around um, was that during the peak times of the 2016 election cycle, uh, websites like these can make anywhere between $10,000 and $30,000 a month. So yeah, it's, it's big business. Now, fake news has been around for a long time. It really is nothing new, um, especially when you think about things like clickbait as nothing more than yellow journalism. 
which, by the way, yellow journalism was a term that was coined in 1890s. So it's been around for over a century. This type of news coverage, it just, it, it works. Um, so let's, let's try to talk more about what might get people to believe things even th if they are distorted or just plain untrue. So let's take a look a little bit uh, into uh, the psychology of this so-called bubble. And we're gonna take a look at three sort of principles uh, that can kind of explain this. And I hope y'all don't fall asleep. <laughs> so the first thing is system one and system two thinking. Uh, this is from thinking fast and slow. So essentially we have two sort of ways of thinking and using our brain power. Uh, system one is fast, intuitive. Uh, it's things that you don't have to think about to do, so you don't have to actively think about driving. Like if you, if you drive home and you've driven home a million times and you're just kind of on autopilot, you just do it. You're not really actively thinking about it. It's kind of in the back of your mind. That's the type of like think system one thinking. And beliefs are system one thinking. This is why it's hard to get people to change their beliefs because they're very much um, an intrinsic part of, of them. Then you have system two thinking. And system two thinking, it's more analytical. It's your reasoning. So this is why when you are presented with things that challenge your worldview, it's not that it's challenging your worldview that's negative. It's that it just, it's literally more challenging to think about those things because you have to use your analytical mind. So this is why it's hard to process information if it differs from our own beliefs or worldview or if it challenges that. And this is also why it's just easier to consume information that you already tend to agree with that already conforms to your own beliefs. Now, the next part comes from a book called The Knowledge Illusion, which is kind of fascinating and it talks kind of about how much we don't know um, so essentially what the authors of the knowledge illusion talk about in relation to how little we don't know is that if we had to know every single detail about everything that we use in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, we'd like, we just wouldn't be able to function because it's too much information, just how, uh, like Ben was saying, uh, in his talk. And... Essentially, uh, the, the example that they like to use is if everyone insisted on mastering the principles of metalworking before picking up a knife, the Bronze Age wouldn't have amounted to much. To sort of bring that into the now, it's kind of like if you needed to know absolutely everything there is to know about a car, not just driving a car, but everything with the motor and the tires and the radio, like imagine every single part that goes into a car, knowing intimately every detail about it, on top of also knowing how to drive, like it's just too much information, you wouldn't be able to drive, your brain would just explode, right? So your brain does a really good job of just, you. all you need to do is know enough to how to do this thing, and your brain will sort of fool you and give you the comfort that it's okay that you don't know all of these other things so you can actually do the thing that you need to do. Um, so <laughs> I'm also gonna talk about the bike study. Um, so essentially this study was asking people to draw a bike, but also rank their own knowledge of a bike. So they would be asked, how well do you know bikes on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the highest? And then people would say, I know bikes. You know, I would give myself maybe an eight or a nine. And then they would say, okay, draw the bike. And then people would be like, whoa, <laughs> I actually can't do this. And you start thinking just like, uh, just like in that other um, drawing that Ben was showing. And if anybody is watching this on the recording, go and watch learning to see from this same conference um, 
because it's essentially the same thing. People realize uh, it's, you know, it's your perception of something and you only remember as much as you need. So some people really drew the tires really big because that's what they remembered. Some people, they always drew the seat because they know they got to sit on it. Um, and after people attempted to draw the bike and then they realized that they really couldn't, then they would be asked again, how well do you, would you say you know bikes on a scale from one to 10, 10 being the highest? And people would say, oh, well, I guess it's more of a, you know, six. Uh, so typically <laughs> what would happen is that people would experience their own lack of knowledge and be, become aware that they didn't know something but you don't know that you're not aware of that until you experience that depth. So we are wired to be okay with not knowing. And in fact, we tend to think that we know more than we actually do. And this is because beliefs are not actually rooted in deep understanding. You just need to know a little bit. But furthermore, what's even more interesting about that is that if that belief is shared in a group, that belief is reinforced. So we only need to know very little about things. And if we believe in this in a group with other people, there's like the sense of belonging and it also reinforces that belief. So again, this is another reason why it's really hard to get people to be convinced otherwise when they are challenged with uh, something that might be different from what they already believe or what their worldview is. Now, I think that uh, Clay Johnson really distilled a lot of this information really well in the informa information diet. So what I want you to do right now is close your eyes and think about your most favorite delicious food that is like bad for you but you love it so for me that would be like a bacon cheeseburger and some cheesy fries and now I want you to think about food that's good for you that you do consume every now and then because you know it's good for you but you don't really like it and for me that would be like kale um, so hold on to that. You can open your eyes now. Just, just know what your foods are, what your likes and your dislikes are. And let's think, think about this. So in information diet, Clay Johnson says, information that you agree with uh, and therefore you find stimulating, it's like eating that delicious food. It's like eating, for me, it'd be like eating a delicious cheeseburger. Um, it's that pleasurable. It, like, it, it sort of lights up those same parts of your brain that light up when you eat food that you find delicious. Uh, and it's the same thing for information that you find challenging. It would be like eating that thing that you don't really like to eat, even if it's good for you. This is why when people are presented, even when they are presented with facts, if they challenge a belief that they have, it's hard for them to literally digest. And if you think about system one and system two thinking, this is because if it's challenging their beliefs, it is requiring them to use their thinking too. And that is your analytical mind. So to try to put all of this and wrap it up, TLDR. So deep beliefs don't require deep understanding. They are actually deepened if they are experienced in a group. We're also not really likely to seek challenging information or information that doesn't really conform to our worldview because again, it requires system, system two thinking, so it's a little bit harder for us to process. But then also, if you think about knowing what we don't know, we may just not know what we don't know, so we're not gonna go seek it out. Uh, and then also, it's just easier to consume information that we agree with, just like junk food is yummy. So, that's really how that bubble is made. So is it tech's fault? And 
a lot of people have said, you know, Facebook needs to take accountability for their role in spreading fake news, et cetera. And I like to say that, you know what? It's not necessarily tech's fault because as you can see, we're wired already to sort of behave this way. But I do think that it is a little bit our fault uh, just because we created these tools that reinforce the behavior. So here's another quote I like, which is, uh, it's by Alan Kay, and he says, the internet was done so well that most people think of it as a natural resource like the Pacific Ocean, rather than, so rather than something that was man-made. When was the last time that a technology with a scale like that was so error-free? And we have moved to a point in our lives with the internet that we literally went from 1998, don't get in strangers' cars, don't meet people from the internet, <laughs> to now literally summon strangers from the internet and get in their car. So, I mean, <laughs> in the span of about 20 years, we've done a complete 180. And if you think about it, you know, people that think the internet is, a, is like a natural resource, they're not really gonna stop and question what they're reading. Also, if you think about the internet as like this stopgap of our shallow knowledge, because now we know that there's a lot that we don't know, uh, even though we might feel like our knowledge is deep, we don't know until we experience that depth. However, we have access to the internet, so the internet can tell us what we don't know, but the internet can tell us a lot of things <laughs> that may or may not necessarily be right. Um, so what can we do as technologists? And I think that there's human solutions and tech solutions. So I'm gonna talk about human solutions first. Uh, and first of all, I feel that media and tech literacy need to become way more important in our society. And it's not just about like, hey, let's try to lobby for schools to teach media literacy to our kids. It's not just that. It's also, it starts with us as technologists educating the people around us that are not in our industry. Because people need to know that, hey, you know what? Anybody can literally go and get a domain name. Uh, let's take usatoday.com or whatever. If they're smart, they probably bought different variations of USA Today. But, you know, if someone's not really paying attention, they might buy USA Today with a five, and if someone's not, with a five for an S, and if someone's not paying attention, and they try to make it look like USA Today, like, anybody can do that, anybody can make a mock of a website, and people need to know how that's done, how easy it is, and I feel like as technologists, we can try to educate the people around us that are not in this industry to let them know, hey, you know what, you really should verify the URLs, make sure that they're correct, et cetera. Little things like that. So I feel like a lot of that just starts with us and our own lives. And then also, there are a ton of organizations, nonprofit or otherwise, that offer programs for teaching kids how to program, and I think that's also really important. Now, whenever we look at that clip that we saw in the beginning, People typically say, well, people are smart enough to figure out that it's fake. And here's the thing. We work in technology. We know what we can do. It's probably easier for us. So we are, we are in a bubble in and of itself because it's easier for us to be able to see the seams. But imagine if someone shares a clip that's kind of like what I showed you today, which is a video that's fake. Uh, with fake audio and fake video, and someone shares that within their social sphere, well, if, that, if the message in that video already sort of reflects my own beliefs and it was shared by someone that I know that shares those beliefs, do you really think that that person's gonna say, like, that's fake? That's, that's challenging a belief that they have, so they would probably be more likely to maybe buy into it. We just we just don't know. And we can't really hide behind that excuse of, well, people are smart to know that it's fake. Uh, especially when we don't really provide media literacy 
uh, classes to people. So we really can't just say people will know it's fake because they probably won't. Now, from a tech perspective, uh, I want to talk real quick about some tech solutions. So there's this thing called Perspective API. That's really cool. It uses machine learning, and it hooks up into your comment commenting system, and it gives people feedback on what they're writing so that they can, um, if someone's writing a comment that might be kind of toxic, uh, the Perspective API will provide some feedback like, hey, you might want to reconsider what you're writing, kind of like Clippy, uh, but I guess just a nicer Clippy. Um, there's also, um, out of all places, BuzzFeed had this feature called Outside the Bubble, which like essentially at the bottom of uh, their articles, they would have things like this, like what are other people on the internet saying about this topic? And I think that's interesting uh, because this might give people a chance to actually go out of their own bubble. There's also something along this, uh, this idea done by the Wall Street Journal called Blue Feed, Red Feed. And this is essentially like a curated list around different topics of what a blue feed looks like and what a red feed looks like so that people can go and see differing views on a specific topic. I think this is really neat. However, just like we learned today, people aren't always going to go seek out information that they disagree with. So I think that we need to, I think that this is on the right track, but people may not necessarily go out and seek something like this on their own. And then also, the Knight Foundation is actually looking uh, for projects that tackle this very thing, uh, combating fake news. So I would say if there's anybody here uh, or watching the talk um, that has an idea about how to fight fake news, go and find an opportunity like this because there are people out there that are providing grants to people with ideas. So go and make it happen because you can do it. Then lastly, I think that we need to think more about the psychology and behavior surrounding the stuff that we build because I feel like as an industry, we talk a lot about best practices. We talk a lot about the nuts and bolts of what we build, techniques, how to test, etc. We talk a lot about the nitty gritty. We don't always talk about psychology. We don't always talk about ethics. And I think that our industry is no longer the baby that it used to be. We've been around for long enough that we need to start talking about these things as an industry if we really want to try to fight things like fake news uh, in tech. And then lastly, kind of going along those lines, I feel like part of the reason why we don't always get to talk about things like the psychology or the ethics of what we build um, is because we're so concerned with disrupting as opposed to actual change. And I feel like that really needs to change in our industry because disruption is fast. I can poke you and I just disrupted you, but did I get you to actually stand up? Change, actual change takes time and I think that we need to start moving more towards an idea where we're working towards fixing actual issues that are going to take time, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right, as opposed to we're just going to go and disrupt this thing right now. Because otherwise, we're not really going to get to tackle the important issues that we need to tackle as a society. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And if you want to read my slides and look at some of the links that I have, uh, you can go to sesi.co slash fake dash news dash psych and read more. Thank you.